Good evening and welcome to the Columbia Alumni Association's Columbia at Home series. We're so glad you've joined us for tonight's discussion. I'm Keith Goggin, chair of the CAA board and a proud graduate of the School of Journalism. This evening's program is Making Decisions in Uncertain Times and I'm joined by Columbia Business School adjunct professor and fellow journalism school graduate, Cheryl strauss einhorn Cheryl is the creator of the Area Method, a decision-making system to solve complex problems. She is the founder of coaching and consulting firm CSE Partners and educational technology company Decisive. She's the author of two books on decision making, Problem Solved, A Powerful System for Making Complex Decisions with Confidence and Conviction, and Investing in Financial Research, A Decision Making System for Better Results. Cheryl has won multiple journalism awards for investigative stories about international, political, business, and economic topics. Her area method is used across broad domains ranging from low-income high schools to multinational companies and government agencies. I'm particularly pleased that Cheryl has asked me to host this evening because the two of us have been friends going back almost all the way to our time at Columbia, and we've always been linked by our time at the J School, even though we graduated one year apart. I'm a 1991 graduate of the J School, and in early 1992, I took an entry-level journalism job with Investment Dealers Digest. Just a few months later, Cheryl graduated from the J School as a member of the class of 1992 and landed an entry-level job at the very same company sitting just a few cubicles away. When you're working in a cubicle farm, you get a pretty good idea of who, who the best reporters are, so I know from my time at IDD that Cheryl is a truly exceptional reporter. She has an innate ability to dig in and ask the important questions that allow her to get to the heart of the story. Tonight's discussion will delve into the decision-making process Cheryl developed to strengthen her confidence in the analytical integrity of her work as a reporter, which she has subsequently expanded to help both individuals and companies make strategic decisions. The format for this evening will be a discussion with Cheryl for about a half an hour, followed by an audience Q&A period at the end of the program. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the time that we have. Before we get started, I'd like to offer a quick shout out to Brittany Baddock and Gibson Knott, who are handling the technology for me behind the scenes. All credit goes to Brittany and Gibson, and I will take full responsibility for any glitches. I am pleased to welcome Cheryl Strauss-Einhorn to Columbia at Home. Cheryl. Keith, it's great to be here with a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. So Cheryl, I'm gonna kick this off by asking you a little bit about the origins of the area method. Why is decision-making so important to you and how did the idea for the area method come to you in the first place? Well, it came to me because we all grew up to be decision-makers and yet somehow there's no well-established way to make complex decisions. We don't teach it formally in our homes and until very recently, we haven't really taught it in our schools. And yet if we all had a system for solving complex problems, we wouldn't just be able to get closer to our goals, we could get closer to our dreams. That being said, for me, the reason why I initially came up with this system is that as somebody who worked at Barron's, the business magazine for over a decade, I ended up specializing in what you might call the bearish company story. As you well know, those are stories that take a skeptical look at a company's finances or at their strategy. And when those stories came out, there was often a huge share price reaction. Sometimes a stock exchange would halt the stock. Sometimes regulators would get involved. And oftentimes what I realized is it wasn't just somebody's investment portfolio that was being impacted. If you were an employee at a company, it was your ability to go to work in the morning. Or if you were a customer, it was your ability to use the product or service. And to just give you a sense of the type of impact that I'm talking about, after one of my stories, which talked about possible Medicare fraud at the largest maker of diabetic test kits, it all of a sudden called into question the integrity of a product that millions of people use every day for their own health. At another company where I exposed that they were selling used car batteries as new, the CEO ended up going to jail for 10 years. And so these are products that we rely upon. And what I realized is with such an outsized impact for these kinds of stories, 
I just wondered, well, how could I have greater confidence and conviction in my own ability to solve complex problems? How did I know the incentives and motives of the sources who were coming to me with their story ideas? And how did I know with my own flaws that I come with that I was looking and understanding and analyzing data correctly. So I initially put the system together simply as a way to do a more ethical job at Barron's. So there are a lot of decision-making frameworks out there. Can you explain what makes your method special? Sure. So my system, which is called the AREA method, and AREA is an acronym for the steps of my process, is unique in part because it's a perspective-taking system. And so what it tries to do is to control for and counteract cognitive bias. Right? We're all a product of our environment. I grew up outside of Boston. It's a lovely upbringing. But basically, the way that I see and understand the world is a product of my family and my environment. And so we now know that we all do come with these types of assumptions and judgments. And while these mental shortcuts help us when we're trying to get through a busy day, they don't go away from when solving for complex problems. And so what AREA really tries to innovate is the way that we approach our thinking and the way that we integrate information from a variety of different sources. Okay, so walk us through the basic steps for using the AREA method. So uh, when we put up our first visual map, I put together two visual maps because most of us are visual learners. So AREA, as I said, is an acronym for the steps of my process. Here you see a series of concentric circles because not all investigations are linear, nor should they be. At times you need to be driven back into either part or all of the process. But the basic idea is that it is the opposite of Google. Right, right now when we're solving for complex problems, we generally type something into a search engine and immediately we're in all perspectives at once. And we tend to listen to the loudest ones, the ones that come up to the top first without any sense of their incentives and motives and without a clear way to really hear what our inner voice is telling us. So what AREA does is it separates out the sources of information so that you move through them one perspective at a time. So the absolute perspective, that's the smallest circle at the bottom, that is information from up close on the target of your decision itself. It's primary source information. So let's say you're investigating the World Bank. Absolute information would be information from the bank itself. It might be looking at its financial disclosure, reading through its website, and understanding in its own words what it has to say about itself. Then relative, the next concentric circle is the next perspective. And that is sources that are somehow related to the target of your decision, but not from the target itself. Think of it in the case of the World Bank, that it might be the watchdog groups that assess what the bank does. It might be groups that fund the bank. It might be those beneficiaries who receive the services that the bank renders. So it is putting your decision target into its broader context. And then the E's in area, exploration and exploitation, are what I refer to as the twin engines of creativity. Exploration is about getting beyond document-based sources, identifying good prospects and asking them great questions. So it's essentially about interviewing. And then exploitation is about deepening our understanding of how we as decision makers process information. And I give you a series of creative exercises that I've learned from experts in other fields, such as the intelligence community or investigative journalism, where you can really assess your assumptions against your evidence. And then the final A analysis cobbles the pieces back together, helps you think even at this late stage, how could that decision fail? Because at this point, you generally have a pretty good idea of what you're gonna do, and it helps you to come to conviction. And so the perspective taking gives you this beautiful two for one. By inhabiting each perspective one at a time, you get a sense of walking in these other perspectives, footsteps to understand their incentives and motives, and to also gain distance on yourself, which helps you to better spot, control for, and hopefully counter your assumptions and judgments. 
So why is the process itself important? So the process itself, and I think we can take down the visual map if you'd like. I think the process itself is important because what I like about process is that it doesn't discriminate. It's a truly equitable tool. You don't need extra money. You don't need extra resources. All you need to know is how the system itself functions and it can guide you through it by you simply following its logical progression. So you say you make your mistakes before you make them. Explain what it means to make your mistakes before you make them. Well, of course we can't ever make all of our mistakes before we make them. But I think the other part of the value proposition of area, and there's really sort of four parts to the value proposition. We talked about the perspective taking and the getting up close on the incentives and motives. And we talked a little bit as well as about the feedback loop. But another part of it is really what's been missing is this opportunity to have simple creative exercises where we can check and challenge the way we are bringing assumption and judgments to our data. And so what exploitation does is it helps you make your mistakes before you make them because it gives you these creative exercises where you can really understand the diagnosticity of the information that you've collected, right? I mean, something like a fever, it tells you that something's wrong, but it doesn't tell you what is wrong. And so what you really want to know is how is it that you should see and assess the information that you've gathered against the different kinds of hypotheses that you're thinking through for the problem solving that you're engaging in. So what are some of the common biases that we face and how do we fall prey to those biases and how does the area method help us mitigate that? So First of all, I have a chart in the beginning of both problem solved and investing in financial research that take you through the common cognitive biases and where in the book area addresses them so that you specifically can have an idea about how the steps really do try to control for and counter bias. But a couple of the ones that we all tend to fall prey to, one of them is the liking bias, right? We tend to believe and favor opinions coming from people that we like. Another one of them is social proof. We do tend to follow things that the crowd is doing. So we notice that Tiger King is number one on Netflix and we end up watching Tiger King. Or another one is the confirmation bias where we see and fit information into a hypothesis that we wanna confirm. We can have disconfirming data right in front of us, but we generally tend to try to confirm what we already think we agree with. So that's just a couple of examples. So earlier in the program, you talked about um, understanding your sources biases when you're working on an article for Barron's. Um, why is it important to understand the motivations not only of ourselves, but also of other people that are involved? Well, I think what's been happening is generally we think of decision making as something that's siloed. We're making a decision. But the truth is, is none of us operate in a vacuum. So it would be beneficial to stop thinking of decision making as atomistic. And what area is, is inherently built on a collaborative backbone. This idea of the perspective taking, of getting up close on the individual stakeholders involved in the decision, those different sources of information, it really helps us to understand where they're coming from, what is driving their thought process and their behavior, and it can really give us an opportunity to act with empathy and understanding so that we can solve our problems holistically. If we have an opportunity to really understand where the other stakeholders are coming from, we have a much better opportunity to have that decision succeed for us. So you and I have talked a lot about how you developed what you call the cheetah pauses. And um, it turned out that we both love the same New York Times article about cheetahs. Can you Talk to our audience tonight a little bit about the cheetah pauses and why those are in your method. Absolutely. So uh, one of the other parts of the value proposition um, for area is that it builds in strategic stops. I think what happens is, is we often get started on something and then we, we don't know when to pause. When do we make our work 
truly work for us. And that's what the cheetah pauses are. I call them cheetah pauses because the cheetah's prodigious hunting skill is not its ability to accelerate like a race car. It's actually its ability to decelerate by up to nine miles an hour in a single stride. And that's far more impact, uh, far more important than the acceleration because now you're talking about agility, flexibility, and maneuverability all those things that you need in a quality research and decision-making system. So everywhere where I suggest a cheetah pause, a strategic stop, I have a cheetah sheet. Then you can think of them like sticky notes throughout both of the books and the process. Because what the cheetah pauses do is they say, okay, now you've collected this particular group of information, here are either questions that you'd want to ask of the data that you've collected or analysis that I might suggest, and also other sources of information that you might turn to that could help you to expand the information that you're collecting. So let's turn to the critical concepts. Um, how does one go about figuring out what it is that matters to them in the decision-making process? It's a great question. So one of the most off-putting parts of complex problem solving is how do you get started? There's so much information out there and how do you know that you are choosing quality sources? So what Aria says is don't worry about that and instead invert your problem solving and ask yourself something that I think is far more empowering and that you can answer without even having started to solve the problem, which is what has to happen to you in the outcome of the decision for you to know that it has succeeded for you personally. That's what I call the vision of success. You don't even have to know how you're gonna solve it to know what has to happen for you in the outcome for that decision to have been successful. From there, you derive what I call the critical concepts, which are the one, two, or three things that you need to deeply and creatively investigate to solve for that vision of success. And the reason why this is so powerful is that now you no longer have an open-ended problem to solve. Instead, you have something that is uniquely focused on what you've deemed is the vision of success. So um, I wanna to pivot to a two-part question regarding validity. First, how do we evaluate the quality of the data that that we have um, gathered? And then how do we uh, evaluate the strength, the correctness, and the validity of the decisions that we make based on that data? Okay, so if we take the quality of information first, throughout the process, I guide you step-by-step step on what is a quality research due diligence process, because all the other decision-making systems out there basically say explore your options or conduct your research as if it's a single step. But as many of us know, research is an umbrella term for a whole series of tricky steps that need to be thoughtfully and carefully navigated. And so AREA breaks it down so it's not a black box and it takes you step-by-step step through that progression. But the way that you can understand that your information is quality information is not only by being able to look at where the source is, but how is that data set constructed? A very easy example for this Columbia audience that may resonate well is when we were applying for colleges, and still today, one of the popular things to look at is the US News and World Report listing of the colleges. So the question is, is why would a college make that list? What does the ranking actually mean? So if you wanted to assess the quality of the data, you would look at, well, how do they construct that? And what's fascinating about that list is that they include not only endowment money, but professor salaries in those rankings. Now that might make a difference to some people, but if you're a student who's thinking about applying, I'm not sure that that's a criteria that would really be so important to you. And so knowing that the rankings are constructed in part in that way changes how you understand the quality and the diagnosticity of that piece of data. So that's the first part. For the second part, where you asked a little bit about trying to evaluate the strength, correctness, and validity of your decisions based on the data, I have two thoughts on that. One is, is that 
as you are collecting new information and conducting new analysis, you would also be wanting to update and iterate your critical concepts so that you're constantly incorporating the new information and new data. So that's one thing that you are continually working on. But the second thing is that area builds a beautiful audit trail of your work. Now we don't think of building an audit trail of our decisions, but we audit our finances each year. And frankly, I would say that auditing our decisions is at least as important as auditing our finances. And so in each part of the process, you're being guided on how do you take notes and write a thesis statement based on what you're learning so that you're truly making your work work for you. Again, using that cheetah analogy, you're slowing down to speed up the efficacy of what you're doing. And so this audit trail can hold you accountable and also prevent evolving hypotheses so that you have an ability to look back and say, did I have good luck or bad luck? Did I have good analysis and so on? And so I think both of these pieces are important and, um, and thank you for those questions. Um, so I wanna give you a chance to talk about um, some of the work you've done based on the area method. So you recently worked with the State Department and the US Embassy in Jerusalem and in Istanbul. Um, could you share something about your work that you've done with um, our country's uh, State Department helping to promote civil society? I think that really works in well with, with one of the central tenets of Colombia. Sure, and I just did a big project for the State Department last week, so, um, so we can mention that too. So for the work that I did in Israel and in Turkey, I was working with civil society nonprofits to help them think about the strategic decision-making that they were making. And I also worked, it happened to be right after in Israel, our embassy was moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And so I also worked with our foreign service staff thinking about what does it look like to be able to promote a way that we can strengthen those relationships that may have had some feathers ruffled when the embassy was moved. Um, in terms of last week's work, one of the groups that I worked with was our International Visitor Leadership Program. This is an education department within the State Department that tries to identify future leaders in other countries and bring them to the United States so that we can build relationships with them and we can also have an opportunity to really showcase democracy. And so obviously they're not gonna be able for some period of time with the COVID outbreak to be able to bring international visitors here. So they were trying to think about what kind of a pivot could they make to continue to have meaningful, engaging programming with this group of people that traditionally they'd want to be bringing here. So I'd like to take a few minutes and, and turn to practical decision-making strategies that we can all use right now in, in this, uh, you know, in this new environment. So the framework of our society has been substantially recalibrated over the last 90 days. Um, and you recently published a blog post on your area method website titled area decision making getting to yes in a COVID no world. So sometimes we plan based on a set of assumptions that just later prove untenable. How do we pivot? So I think it's a great question. I've been thinking a lot about how troublesome expectation is, right? We develop an idea in our mind and we sort of have a, a way that things are gonna go and pivoting becomes very difficult. But I can give two examples. One is of a young couple that was supposed to have their wedding in May. Many couples have chosen that they're gonna delay so that they can truly celebrate with all of their loved ones. But for this particular couple, 5, 10, 20 was a very meaningful date for them. And they wanted to uh, be able to have their wedding. And initially, they certainly didn't think that that was going to be able to occur. And this concept of vision of success, this becomes something that really can help you to be able to understand what your optionality is. Because for many couples, that vision of success is celebrating with loved ones. Once this couple realized that their vision of success was actually getting married on 5, 10, 20, 
And then their critical concepts were, well, you know, how are states handling the fact that they're not allowing large groups to get together? Might states have some accommodations so that maybe other people could officiate? Or could there be another way to engage in this? And what are other couples doing in other places? Is there any other information out there so that maybe we could still bring community together? And so that helped them to figure out that the state law had said that they could have other people officiate. And this young bride was able to initially ask her father to officiate, which would be a different and in some ways potentially more meaningful service if they had decided to do that. And then also to obviously use Zoom to bring people together. For a company that I recently worked with that is a startup company that has um, an AI technology that helps workplaces to better understand how the people in their spaces can work more effectively. They all of a sudden had their customers cancel projects and they had also been going through a round of fundraising, which immediately had been called off as investors pulled out. And so what I worked with them on is how could they better understand what their customers were going through and have a close up experience on the customer perspective, instead of thinking from their own perspective, which is, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? How am I going to pay my employees and focusing on, on this, business itself, which is called Spacemate, by turning and looking at the customer perspective and recognizing that what the customer was experiencing is that their customers now were not so interested in thinking about how do you use space for productivity and now needed to be thinking of space related to safety. This company, I was able to help guide them to think about could they use their existing technology which works on process efficiency to think about safety itself as an optimization. And so again, this idea of developing your vision of success and critical concepts, and then putting those through the area method and the different perspectives where you gather and analyze information is something that I think can really help in an uncertain time for us to recognize that while we'll never get certainty, the future is always uncertain, that we always want a way to work with and work through ambiguity. So um, I have one last, I guess, question or, or topic that I'd like to work through, and then maybe we can uh, start turning this over to some questions from the audience. Um, but, you know, we're all faced with a whole new set of day-to-day -day decisions. Um, you know, no matter how old we are, no matter um, how long ago we graduated from Columbia, we're all facing something together that none of us has ever had to face before. So, you know, can our kids have play dates? Can we visit our aging parents and under what circumstances? Um, you know, can we even go out for a slice of pizza out to dinner, you know, visit with friends if they're quarantining as well? Um, can you discuss risk assessment and how risk assessment can be personal and how, you know, how we can use that to make these decisions? Absolutely. It's a great question. And I actually, on my website, on areamethod.com, I have a blog post on decision making in uncertain times that really takes you through thinking through the different components of risk. But what I would recommend for this is that each of us have a different risk tolerance. And each one is right for us individually. Again, one of the nice things about decision making is there's no one right answer, but there likely is a right answer for you or your organization individually. And so thinking through what to me is an acceptable risk, how do I think about being able to engage with that risk and how is it that I think about what the downside is. We were talking before about making your mistakes before you make them. There's a very easy exercise that I have in both of the books, which is called the pre-mortem. Now it's the opposite of the post-mortem where the joke is everybody benefits but the patient because it's when the doctor is doing the autopsy. But the pre-mortem says, okay, before you make a decision, imagine that it's failed and actually tell the story of the failure, not just in your mind, see if you can write it down, because writing is thinking, and it helps you see things in a totally different way. 
And so by telling the story of failure, you get two things. One, you can identify weaknesses in your strategy, and two, you can set up safeguards to prevent your decision from failing in the ways that you've identified. And so I think that really understanding the components of risk and being able to also say, how do I think about what the downside is? If it goes awry, how does it go awry? Am I okay with that? What kind of safeguards could I set up to prevent it? Those are a couple ways that we each can grapple with, how do I decide when I'm going out to visit with a group of friends or when it is that I might return to a restaurant and so on. Um, I, I will say that you know, my personal editorial comment to this is that, I, you know, I think this is a really important thing for um, people to understand based on some of the um, some of the discussions that I've had internally at Columbia, obviously I'm the chair of the CAA, so we have a bunch of updates, but one of the things that the, the social workers and mental health professionals have said is important during this time period is to control the things that you can control um, because the things you can't control, you just can't control. Um, but, you know, using this risk analysis and, and figuring out what, um, you know, what your critical concepts are may help people gain control over more of, you know, of the decisions that they make, it, you know, many, as, as we all know, many of the decisions are being made for us right now, you know, colleges, including Columbia are deciding what the format is going to be of classes and, you know, individual states and municipalities are, are discussing the terms under which we can do business. Um, you know, but we still have a, an aspect of our life, even within those frameworks yes. that we can make and, decisions And on. I want to just stress what you're saying, because I think what you're saying is, is actually very important. And, and obviously, I've certainly seen it, not only in myself, but also in my kids. A lot of things right now are becoming obligatory, right? It, as you said, it's obligatory that we're staying home. It's obligatory in certain places that we're wearing masks. And... There's nothing that we can do about it, but we still have tremendous agency, right? Researchers tell us that we make something like 40,000 decisions in a given day. Everything from what side of the bed to get up in the morning to the way that we squeeze our toothpaste. Cornell researchers tell us we make over 200 decisions about food alone every day. And so we still do have a tremendous amount of agency. And the way that we engage with our decisions that's up to us. And that's got a lot of optionality to it. And so I hope that people really recognize that while certain things are obligatory and are out of our control, the way that we respond to the information and the way that we engage with the decisions that we have, our choices, that is truly and uniquely from each of us individually. And I hope that there is a great sense of liberation in that. So um, I think at this point, we're going to take some time um, to flip over to the audience and, uh, and try to answer some of their questions and, right. and give them a little, um, a little bit of, uh, of your insight. So the, the first question comes from uh, Daniela Ortega. And Daniela wants to know, how do you avoid slowing down the decision-making process by applying the area method? How do you avoid slowing it down? I mean, I guess, I guess really her question is, you know, it, many of the decisions that we have in our life have to be made in a certain amount of time. Okay. You know, how, do, how do we process it through this so, framework and still meet that, you know, meet right. those constraints? So, um, so that's a great question. And we all are resource bound and we should be. We should be constrained um, by our time and our resources. And so what I would say is that the area method is meant to be agile and flexible like, like the cheetah. So while the books, which are only about 200 pages, because I know we are all busy, and when I got to 200, I just started cutting, so that it would be something that was manageable, practical for people, is that the books take you through what is the whole process if you've got the time for it so you can see how the different pieces fit together and 
problem solved in particular follows four different kinds of decision makers, two that are solving personal complex problems and two that are solving professional complex problems so that you have enough examples that no matter what it is that you're solving, hopefully you say, I get it, I can apply it. But you get to pick and choose the pieces that you wanna choose. If you do one piece in each step, or if you just do, let's say, the exercises, a couple of them in the exploitation chapter, anything that you do that is new for you ups your rigor and discipline in terms of complex problem solving. And that's good. So our next question is from Eduardo Moda. And, um, you know, you, you speak a little in the book and you and I have spoken about this, about the fact that a lot of people go on their gut. They, you know, they make decisions based on instinct. Um, and, and he's wondering, you know, what's the role of instinct in our decision-making process? So it's a great question. That's actually what my TED talk is about. And what I would say is that what area gives us the opportunity to do is to audit our gut. When does our gut do a good job? And when should we check and challenge our gut? When is our gut working on fear or some other emotion? Because we do wanna have an opportunity to be able to know when to listen to it. And so what area does with this focus on the cognitive biases is really give you an opportunity to test it and to know whether or not you wanna follow it. So up to this point, everything we've talked about today has, has been individual decision making. How can we take the area method and apply it to group decision making? How can, how can we get a, a group to work in this framework? So I think it's really well suited for groups. I've worked with a lot of companies with their teams and the reason why they tell me that they like it is that it's got a beautiful framework for inclusivity. Right, it's built on this collaborative backbone that we talked about before, which is predicated on being able to understand the different stakeholders who are involved in your decision. And so what it does is it really gives you a way to remove the emotion from decision making, have a rational, practical, and actionable process to follow, and builds this audit trail of what was the work and what was the thinking. So it gives you a discussion document that has entry point for everybody in the process. I'll just give you one really quick example. One CEO who I was working with had a wine import business and the company had been around for over 20 years, but the sales had been steadily going down. And he decided that he wanted to put in place an incentive compensation plan. Well, this is a very unpopular decision, for a sales staff that never had to perform against specific, specific metrics and different types of evaluation that an incentive plan would bring. And so he first used area and he showed the empathy and understanding and the perspective taking that he used to develop the system that he came up with. And then he was able to sit everybody down and he was able to say, you guys know the numbers, you're actually our sales staff, but, I, and I think we need to change. This is, this is how I'm thinking about it. This is the data that I collected. This is the analysis that I've done. And how can we talk about this and come up with something that we think will strengthen the company? And so I, I think it's a really nice way to bring diversity, equity, inclusion, and so on to team decision making. All right, so I'm gonna throw you um, a real world question that one of our um, viewers has, has lobbed in anonymously. Um, this person would like to hear your, your thoughts on how the area method could help in making a decision now about relocating to another state prior to finding a new job in, you know, in the context of a, of a radically uh, upturned labor market, you know, and, and, you know, questions about how states and, and municipalities are going to deal with reopening the economy. 
So this person wants to know about relocating to a new place without how, having found a job? This person wants to know how, how the area method framework could be used to help them make this decision. Well, the first thing would be to develop the vision of success. If it's worked out well, what's happened, right? And so the person would answer that and then they would come up with their three critical concepts from there, the one, two, or three things that they're gonna deeply and creatively investigate to solve for that vision. So if we were to say that somebody wanted to move to a place where there would be more outdoor space, let's just take that for an example. I think that's something that a lot of people have been thinking about. You know, you would say, does the outdoor space have to be located near certain types of industries? Right? Does the outdoor space need to be able to have a certain cost of living? Do you see how already you'd be on very different research paths, depending upon how you're defining this vision of success? And that's why it becomes so important to get clear on what has to happen in the outcome for it to be successful for you. Does the person need to be able to work in a collaborative environment or is it something that could remain remote, that also would impact how much um, of a, a place that might be remote might be possible and so on. And so again, getting clear on the vision of success, deriving the critical concepts, and then putting them through the area steps is how I would think about that. Okay. And I could, I could see in this particular example that, um, you know, there could be wildly disparate visions of success. On one hand, it might be that someone has always wanted to live in Austin. On the other hand, it might be that someone really wants to get out of New York or New Orleans or, or a city that has a, um, right. you know, and so, impacted heavily. And that's this idea that for each of us, we could be looking at the exact same data set and have entirely different takeaways, not only because of our cognitive biases and the way we have our lens on the world, but also because of that vision of success. So um, Walter Rivera asks, how does visualizing positive outcomes as opposed to looking at the pre-mortem scenario of potential negative outcomes play into the area method? Well, visualizing positive outcomes is optimism bias. And you know, it's, um, it's good to be optimistic um, and you certainly do wanna hope for the best, but I, I think the pre-mortem and this idea about thinking about the downside is something that's really very powerful. It's nice to think about how things can go right, but you also really do want to have the opportunity to check and challenge those biases and to understand what the diagnosticity is of the evidence that you've collected. Um, let's see, uh, I have a question from Kenneth Morgan. Um, which is which is fairly involved. It says years ago, one of the problems was analysis paralysis, uh, the need to have more data or information, looking for the 99% solution versus the 95% solution while you waited for more data, and and he feels like that problem got out of hand, and now we have too much info, um, and the problem is selecting what's critical and what's sufficient. Um, and he says, you've addressed much of this, but the question is related to the 95% or whatever the right percent is decision. Um, how do you do that with the flood of information without running out of time, either because you have a deadline or because so, this, the decision becomes moot because it's taking you too long? So again, think of the cheetah. Area is very strategic. All information is not equal. You're not looking for all information. The whole reason why you're inverting your problem solving and getting clear on the vision of success as opposed to starting with an N equals all, how do I grow my business, for instance, or where do I wanna live, for example, is because you don't want all information. You wanna derive the critical concepts and then you wanna deeply and creatively investigate those few things that you think will solve for that vision of success. And as I said, you'll update and you'll iterate based on the information and analysis that you collect, but you don't have all the time in the world. 
and you don't want to have analysis paralysis and you don't want to have all information. And so what you want to do is invest in yourself as a decision maker. We don't traditionally think of sitting down and coming up with a vision of success, but it is something that once you start, you'll understand why it's such a powerful time saver and a powerful tool for helping to harness your own agency and what you do to be success. So um, what tips do you have for persuading from the gut, do it my own way managers to use a more analytical method like the area method? Um, I have this two. questioner believes there's, there's too many impulsive decision makers that haven't taken the time to do the analysis. So I have, I have two responses to that. You mentioned at the outset that I have a decision-making software company called Decisive. Well, I developed a just a brief digital module. You can do it on your phone or you can do it on the computer and I call it the problem solver profile. And what it does is it gives you uh, some quiz questions and at the end you end up self-identifying into one of five decision-making archetypes, what I call your problem solver profiles. And so from there you can get a sense of how you tend to make decisions as a default. And this works really well with the gut decision makers because what ends up happening is after you've taken this quiz the, and figured out what problem solver you are, it then gives you a template of what are the strengths of self-identifying that way, but what are also some of the potential pitfalls? And by those, I mean the top three cognitive biases that tend to be associated with being that kind of a decision maker. And then it helps take you through some worksheets that will help you bolster your strengths, limit those potential pitfalls, and work better with other kinds of decision makers. Now, gut decision makers often tend to be very confident people. And there's something that's truly lovely about that, to have confidence and conviction in what you're doing and figure it'll all work out. At the same time, this kind of a module really helps you think about the fact that you may be operating with other kinds of decision makers. You may have listeners, or you may have visionaries who are traditionally very creative, or you may have thinkers or detectives. And getting a sense on who you're working with can also help to improve the efficacy of your decision making. So that's one thing that I think is useful. But the second thing is, I would just say to those people, wouldn't you wanna audit your gut? Wouldn't you wanna get a sense of when your gut is telling you something that you wanna follow and when your gut might be lying to you and trying to lead you astray? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then I think we're gonna have to wrap it up for tonight because we're coming up on an hour. Um, Judith Tejada asks, uh, based on your experience with the area method, what industries have you found um, this framework works the best with? And, and I know you've mentioned a couple of companies already, but I'm sure, I'm sure you've, you know, you've had greater success with some than with others. Well, here's what I would say. Um, since we do all grow up to be decision makers, I've been truly surprised that it doesn't matter where it's applied. I've been using it in high schools and in colleges and in graduate programs, but I've been also using it with you know, nonprofits in Nepal. And I've been using it, as you mentioned, with the State Department and with Fortune 500 companies. And so it doesn't matter. Again, this idea of process is a very equitable system. Anybody can use it and apply it and simply by following it, you can get better at what it is that you are doing. And so there's not a right answer for that because it's so far tended to work, whether it's an individual at an inner city high school who's trying to decide whether or not he can live with his mother, or it is you know, the State Department trying to think about how they're going to solve the problem. This has, this has been an absolute pleasure. I feel so fortunate to be a Columbia alumni, from the J School and to also have been teaching at the business school for over a decade. And, and Keith, thank you to you and to all of the Columbia team. And I hope people will reach out to me directly at my website at areamethod.com if they'd like to follow up.
Well, Cheryl, we really appreciate you taking uh, an hour out of your evening. Um, it's great to see your head in the box. This is the new way that we socialize. You know, I'm a social human, so it's good to have some, some uh, interpersonal connection tonight over Zoom. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us tonight. I'm sorry that we couldn't get through all of the questions. Um, you know, if you have, the, have other questions, you can certainly email them to me or to Cheryl or to um, our moderator, and uh, we can work through some of those offline. Um, Brittany and Gibson, thank you. This was a you, technically flawless performance. So you've done everything right and I haven't screwed it up. Um, I want to invite everyone to join us again next week when our Columbia at Home program will be the Columbia Wine Industry Network um, doing the Noble Grapes, a wine tasting overview. A panel of uh, Columbia Win members will introduce you to the six most prominent grape varieties discussing Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Syrah Shiraz next Wednesday at seven o'clock. Those of you who joined the last Columbia Wine Industry Network event know that it was the most heavily attended Columbia at home because everybody needs a glass of wine. Um, as always, you can register at alumni.columbia.edu and uh, I, uh, I hope you'll continue to support Columbia at home uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you.